Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the continuation of our Planet IT webinar series. Um, this one is obviously for, for July. Um, it's good of you to join us again and give up some time in your afternoon, especially as we know everyone is so busy at the moment. Um, and hopefully you'll find today's content really interesting. So today we're talking about managing and securing the modern workplace with Microsoft 365. And I'm hoping that the subject is quite informative and hopefully opens up some opportunities that you didn't know that you could get with Microsoft 365. So before we get into too much of the detail, for those of you who are joining us for the first time today on one of our webinars um, and you don't know who Planet IT is, just a quick overview of who we are. For those of you who have sat these before, I'm sorry if it feels like I'm repeating myself. So Planet IT try to be, and that's what we aim to be, is a one-stop shop for all things IT. So if it's if it's IT related, if it's connectivity, telephone systems, project engineering or support, we're there for you. That's what we intend to be. You, know, you can turn to us for whatever your IT needs are. And we've got experts across the field, security experts, backup experts, people that are dedicated to the these functions that maybe in your roles you don't have enough time to be completely dedicated to and you it gives you a team to lean on. That's essentially what we're here for. And with all these webinars, what we've been doing is trying to share our experiences, share what we have access to, to really help you move forward with your business. And I'm hoping that we can continue to do that today. So joining me today, I'm, I've got Adam Harrison. He's one of our technical architects. And later on, he'd be talking through the security aspects of Office 365 and some of the features you get around that. Um, but I'm going to start off. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm James Dell. I'm head of technical architecture at Planet IT. Um, I've been in, in Planet for about four years now, um, and my role is really to help our customers find solutions, whatever that may be, and for whatever the challenges that you may need to overcome. And I've got the advantage, I suppose, having come from being out there in industry. So I did um, just over 10 years in IT management for various organizations and then decided to make the move across the fence and try and take what I'd learned and use it to help people find the solutions that would help their businesses move forward. And that's what I've been doing for the last four years and I love it. And hopefully today you're going to see a little bit of why I enjoy it so much. So today I want to talk about Office 365 or now as it's known, Microsoft 365. Now, we all know about the traditional Microsoft 365 offering, the, the Word, your Outlook, your PowerPoint, your Excel, hosted email, Microsoft Teams that we're all using right now to be on this event. That's what I consider to be that middle piece, that traditional Office 365, Microsoft 365 offering, the things that we all, we all know Microsoft for. Now, I think that's only part of the puzzle. It's only part of what Microsoft offer in the 365 space. And the things on the outside, Enterprise Mobility and Security and Microsoft Intune are things that people may have heard of, they may be aware of, but it's something that we've noticed that customers are not leveraging as much as they could be. And maybe they have quite a few features in them that add real value to your business offerings and what you can do and what 365 can do for you. And the aim of today is to go through both those aspects on the outside of that, that puzzle piece and talk about what they have inside them, what they bring and why they're important and ultimately how they they can help you do more with 365. Now, Adam's going to talk about enterprise mobility and security in a lot more detail in a little bit. I'm going to start by talking about Microsoft Intune. Now, to give everyone a little bit of a flavor about what Microsoft Intune is, for those of you who aren't aware, Microsoft Intune is a mobile device management and mobile application management platform hosted in Microsoft Azure. So it's there for you to control and manage your devices. Now, it's not something that's new. It's not something that was just suddenly come out from Microsoft. So Microsoft Intune debuted way back in 2011 as Windows Intune. Now at the time, it was an on-premise product. You installed it and it was to coexist with at the time Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager. Now over the following 10 years, Microsoft have refined, redefined and developed this product into something that today is unrecognizable from where it was in 2011, apart from the fact that it underlyingly has some of the same functions. But actually, in terms of what it can offer businesses now, 
is so much greater. So, you know, during that progression over over those 10 years, Microsoft went from just offering Windows support. So it was essentially managers managed Windows 7 at the time. So then including smartphones at the time, very selective smartphones. Then they decided that actually it needed to be more than Windows. So they dropped the name. They added Mac OS, Mac OS X support and now Mac OS support. Then suddenly there was a shift where Microsoft realized that Microsoft Intune and SCCM at the time were too close to each other and they didn't really offer any more value one than the other. It was kind of if you wanted to manage mobiles, you needed Intune. But apart from that, if you were running desktops, because it was both on premise, then it, it, it was a case of actually it makes no sense to have both. So in 2017, they moved Intune into Azure with a focus being of making it accessible from outside of your on premise environment. As we move from 2017 through to today, Microsoft have really focused on engaging that the ability of, of SCCM or System Center Configuration Manager, as it's properly called, and Intune to coexist to give you great on premises management and even better management for users when they're out and about. And obviously, that became more important last year when everyone suddenly dropped ship and left the offices. And the on-premise product of Systems and the Configuration Manager started to struggle a little bit. And there was a definite problem there for many businesses that have been embedded with SCCM for a long time. Now, it's designed to work with SCCM in a coexistence. And when I say coexistence, it really is completely interlinked at this point. You can run either or on their own, completely fine. But Microsoft have lent into the fact that they they work well together. So they do allow you to link the workloads to get the same results. So as you can see, the device in the middle that's actually co-managed with MDM and Configuration Manager, actually it gets the base of both worlds. It can be imaged and controlled on premise, but then if the user's remote, it can be updated and installed applications via the Intune console. Suddenly we're getting the flexibility and then the things that can't be done very well on on premise anymore. So, you know, your mobile devices, your Mac OS devices, that can be done really well in Intune. So actually they shift across to being on the right hand side of that document into the, the cloud native management piece. So it's not a case of if you're using SCCM today that you need to go, right, I need to drop this and move to Intune. However, what we are saying is we're seeing different signs from Microsoft that System Center Configuration Manager is getting long in the tooth. It has been around for a long time and it's limited in how much function it has moving forward for SMB markets, mid markets, and even some enterprises now, because as you start to look at where your user base is going to be and products like SASE and, and areas like that, you don't necessarily want to be having users tunneling back to your office to download massive updates of software when they could be doing it from the cloud. And that's where we see people lean across to Intune becoming the main platform. And we certainly see Microsoft are, are definitely driving that way as they are with all of this cloud strategy that they're going with. Now, it's all good talking about you know in tune and rolling devices imagine, but what does that really mean so this is for those of you who've never heard of Intune before never seen in tune this is what we call the process the life cycle of taking a user or a business from today not using it into using in tune and the device process that goes with that so the first step is enrolling devices now this can be done multiple ways the first of which is by taking a physical device that's already imaged, already set up, and joining it to Intune. So if it's a Windows device via the uh, settings menu on Windows 10 or 11, you can enroll the device in MDM. If it's an iOS device, a Mac OS device, or an Android device, via their app store, you can download the, uh, the client app, sign into it, and then you can enroll those devices. There is also the flip side of that, which is what we call white glove or autopilot's deployment. Now that's where we take a device which is fresh and comes straight from manufacturer to your end user, whether that be directly to their home or to their office, as a fresh device that's automatically enrolled with Intune. Now that's the game changer really, because what we're talking about there is we're talking about drop shipping devices to users wherever they are, they get to the new device experience. They get to cut that seal, that tape, open their laptop up, 
pull off that protective film, turn it on, and then it will prompt them on their login screen to sign in with their 365 credentials. When they do, that then will continue the process of taking the device from enrollment to management as a native Intune managed device. Now, this means for your user base, wherever they may be, you can get devices shipped straight to them. You haven't got to touch them. And then suddenly you're in a position where those devices can be managed and operated without you ha ever having to configure them. So gone are those days of getting USB pens and imaging devices or plugging a device into your LAN and pixie booting them. This process is from factory natively ready to go. Now, once the device is enrolled, it's ready to be managed. And what we mean by managed, it can have it's putting on there the configurations, the compliance policies, and driving the design of that device to be restricted or controlled in the way your business wants them to be. So that can be driven by the user type, the device type. That's about giving you the full control. We then move on to deploying and managing applications. So Intune is great for pushing applications. And I go on to talk more about that in a minute, but any kind of application you have can be packetized and pushed out via Intune, regardless of where your user is, using Microsoft's great infrastructure across the globe to deploy these applications. We then have the ability to not only protect resources, but deploy resources to our end user on any device that they have. And that is any device. If the user has a laptop, it has a desktop, they also have a mobile phone and a tablet, we can, if they're all enrolled in the MDM inside Intune, we can control them all, push data, push apps to all of them, regardless of their profile type. It gives us complete flexibility. And then the final piece of that puzzle is when the device comes end of life, the device is lost, the device is broken, we can pull back that control. So from an application point of view, we can remove the software license keys and bring that back into our license key pool. We can remove the company data, we can remove the Active Directory integration, and we can decommission the device. And we can wipe that and make the device ready for resale if we're going to resell it on, or we can wipe it and make it in a position where the device has no company data on it and there is no risk of that device becoming a problem. It also extends to the kind of lost device approach where you can lock the device out so a user who has lost a device doesn't lose data as well. Now, outside of that, when we talk about MDM, and Intune, it's more important to talk about the fact that we need to do an introduction like we have done just now. And we also need to talk about how you start using Intune because it's not something, although it is quite simple, that you can just pick up and run with. You do need a little bit of guidance to support, but Microsoft are really good in that regard because they have technical references, they've got troubleshooting. It's a supported process that, you know, there is a lot of guidance from Microsoft about how this product works because they want you to use it. Um, but the process definitely needs to start with the understanding of Intune and then understanding that reference material before you can move into actually using that MDM and the life cycle that comes with it. Now I mentioned about software. Now we all know how difficult it can be to deploy software to your end users and um, that's never been more of a problem than it is now because when you haven't got the ability to use tools like PDQ deploy or applications that are quick and easy to bulk deploy applications to domain joined machines that are in your LAN because users are working at home behind different firewalls over internet connections that may not be stable, we need a better way to do it. So with Microsoft Intune, you can do that. So you can take an exe file, an MSI, a Windows Store app, a Microsoft 365 application natively from 365, or if you're on Mac OS, you can take a package file. We can take information from a DMG. We can take Android apps from the Google Store or from the iOS Store. We can identify the applications we need and then if we need to, for example, with an XE file or with a package or a DMG on Mac, we can convert those raw installers into a packetized process file that we can then upload into Intune. So then we convert that file into for Windows, uh, Intune dot, Intune dot Intune win file or a dot Intune Mac file if it's a Mac file. We upload it into Intune. We can configure the information about that application, who it needs to be deployed to, under what circumstances, and then we can push it and deploy it to the user. Now, if that application is an MSI, then it's as simple as adding the MSI to Intune with its install string. So whether that's slash quiet or whatever else it needs to have as an install string to make that application work, including anything you traditionally do in a deployment package program, you can upload that into Intune. 
you can grab straight from the Windows Store a really established working application that you use, whether that's free or paid for by the integration and deploy that. And you can also do bespoke built Microsoft 365 installers. Now, where we previously would have had to make Office 2019, 2016 installers for local machines using answer files and Office configuration files that said install PowerPoint, also install these languages, also install X. You don't have to do any of that configuration anymore. You can literally select to install Microsoft 365 via Intune. You can then build a package built based around what you need for that user. So whether that's just Word, just Outlook, whether that's the whole suite, whole suite plus project, you can do those settings, you can save them, you can publish them and deploy them. Now, the big key from all of this is once that's all done, that is being deployed from Microsoft's Azure infrastructure. We're not deploying it from an on-premise cache server. We're not deploying it from anything that you have to physically hold. The installer files are uploaded into Intune and pushed directly from Intune to the end user's device via the application control mechanism that's installed as part of this. It's a, a seamless process. It's so much easier. Now, Microsoft know how much we all struggle with updates and that's why they've actually extended the update process into Intune and actually taking it from the painful process which is WSUS and Windows um, Update Services which we've all probably dealt with in the past and gone how can we make this better and the first thing we can do to make this better is we can update from cloud repositories rather than updating from your own cache server again, let's use Microsoft's infrastructure, let's use their update system. But likewise, let's be able to flexibly define how quickly machines get updates, just like they've done with Windows 10, where you have the insider fast, insider slow, you know, fast, slow tracks, where you have the different ability to work out what your user base is and, and when it should be getting updates. You can build pilot groups, you can build fast update groups, you can build slow update groups and define who are in them and what categories of updates sit into each one and you can deploy it. And this for Windows doesn't just stop with the standard updates, your security patches and those pieces. It also continues on to your update rollouts and your feature packs, which obviously like we previously had between 20H2 and 21H2, they're massive. If they're deploying to users ad hoc, or in an uncontrolled manner because either they're using native Windows updates or your update service, which maybe isn't working very well. It's a slow process to get everyone upgraded. With Intune, it's a much more controlled process. So in a way that we can see, we can control how they can delay them. We can roll it out to groups of users at the right time. Most importantly, we can report back that it's been successful and deal with the issues where it hasn't been. With for Mac OS, iOS, and for Android, you can also control what updates are deployed and how quickly they're deployed for managed devices. So you get complete control over your update infrastructure. Now, something that I certainly saw when I was running systems was device creep. And this was a problem when you had few users on the road. Now having you know, masses of users on the road or, live, or working remotely, device creep is even more important to stay on top of because your security, compliance, your software updates, your business critical application updates. These pieces need to be controlled. And if you don't have direct contact with your user, you're going to get drift and you have drift, you have problems and you can retrospectively cause damage to your system. Now, to deal with this, Intune has actually got a mechanism of compliance where it will check is a if a device is compliant. Now, that process is against a group of criteria that you set. So that may be, is the device up to date? Is the device running our antivirus? Is the device encrypted? These critical questions that ascertain whether that device is safe to operate for your business. In this process, what it will do is it will check if the device is compliant. If it is compliant, they will deploy, it, sorry, it will deploy software. It will allow system access. It will allow domain access and it will continue to allow the machine to operate and it will then go back into a natural check-in cycle every 30 minutes. However, if it's not compliant, what it will do is it will try to resolve that. It will go, hold on, well, its OS is out of date. It doesn't meet within our last three criteria that we have for cyber essentials or its software patching is out of date. It's missing some critical security patches. 
His policies don't match. It's just, sorry, the machine suddenly is missing some of our latest group policy objects. And what it will then do is apply them where they're relevant. And if it can apply them, it will then resubmit it for device compliance check, and then it will go through the top flow process and be allowed to install software and continue to operate. If it can't make it compliant, it will flag it in the system, flag it to the end user and tell you the device is not compliant, therefore we cannot let it on the system. Straight away, we've put a barrier up that says this device that looks suspicious suddenly can't get access to our system. And this technology leveraged with conditional access that Adam's going to talk about in a bit, actually enables you to really take control of your environment, your infrastructure, your systems, and restrict down access to known controlled applications, devices, and environments. Now, the one thing with Microsoft is always licensing. How does licensing work? It's, it's always a bit of a dark art. Well, try to demystify that a little bit here. So the first thing is, there's three ways to license Intune. The first one is via the standalone Intune license. That's actually sold as Intune in the Microsoft Store or via um, CSP, that's called Intune. It's a standalone license for per user licensing for up to five devices, very similar to the Microsoft 365 approach for Office deployment. So you can deploy Intune to onto up to five devices for a single user. It gives you all the features that we've talked about. So mobile device management, application management for Windows and Mac and all mobile devices. You then have the middle piece, enterprise mobility and security, which is a bundled license as an add-on to Microsoft 365 and the existing plans, which includes not only Intune, but Azure AD protection, conditional access, information protection, and all the extra pieces that go along with that. Again, that's a per user license, gives you the same rights as Intune, but you get a load of other stuff bundled with it. The final piece is your device-based licensing, which is all around devices which are shared. Now, they talk about collaboration rooms in the example. This is also good for education, for classroom-based machines, where you're gonna have multiple members of staff dropping in, dropping out of devices. The idea for this is it's a per device license, one use, it's on a device, therefore that consumes a license, but it doesn't require association with a user. Anything else that's involved via Intune or Enterprise Ability and Security Licensing will have an association to a user because it will consume a license when it has that user sign into it. On DBL or device-based licensing, you don't consume a license when a user logged in. It consumes it when the device checks in and there's no user association. Now, that's a real whistle-stop tour of of Microsoft Intune. It's a great product. Um, it's one of those ones that's great to get your hands onto. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to Adam, who's going to talk to you more around the pieces of the security aspects of what you can get with 365. Thank you, James. So a quick introduction. My name is Adam Harrison, and I work as a technical architect at Planet IT. I've been with Planet for two years and in the industry for 12. I have worked in various roles in support infrastructure and security for both MSP and internal IT departments. So I've seen my fair share of different environments, both in the cloud and on premise. Here we will talk a little bit about the security aspect of Microsoft 365 and the tools available to help you secure access to your environment. So what is enterprise mobility and security? EMS, which used to be known as the Enterprise Mobility Suite, is a comprehensive solution designed to help manage and protect users, devices, apps, and data in a mobile-first, cloud-first world. Microsoft launched EMS in 2014 in an effort to transition from bolted-on security to built-in security, and was intended to bring enterprise-level security to small and medium businesses. Here's a quick overview of what's inside Microsoft Enterprise Mobility and Security. Secure organization, using the tools within Azure Active Directory P1 or P2 Premium to increase security and compliance. Cloud security, a cloud access security broker or CASB that provides multifunction visibility, control over data travel and sophisticated analytics. Threat protection, Azure Advanced Threat Protection is a cloud-based security solution that helps you detect and investigate security incidents across your network. Mobility Management, Microsoft Endpoint Manager or Intune and Configuration Manager. 
threat analysis. Advanced threat analytics is Microsoft's threat detection platform and detects and investigates advanced attacks on your network using uh, machine learning. Secure score, Microsoft's security advisor tool that recommends configuration improvements to help you further secure your environment. And all of these tools help enable efficient remote working and employee flexibility. We can see that Microsoft offer different levels of EMS licensing, E3 and E5. The EMS E3 license includes some features to get you started, such as Intune, conditional access and advanced threat analytics. The EMS E5 license provides more advanced security features than the E3 license. The E5 license includes new and advanced security capabilities that make up Microsoft's holistic and innovative approach to security for the mobile enterprise. It provides cloud app security, Azure advanced threat protection, and also Azure Active Directory P2 Premium, which on its own adds additional features such as privileged identity management, access reviews, and risky user or login prevention. Think of the difference between the E5 and the E3 licenses to be like the difference between driving a Ford Focus and a Mercedes S-Class to work. Of course, nothing wrong with the Ford and it will get you from A to B with no problems, but the Mercedes offers more safety features should you need them and you'll be more comfortable on your journey. All of the features available with the E3 or E5 licenses, such as Intune, Azure AD P1 or P2, or Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics can be obtained separately. However, all of these components are designed to work together to create a comprehensive solution and should be viewed as such. Alternatively, you can purchase Microsoft 365 E3 or E5, which includes Office 365 apps and EMS. This would provide the best value as you are only using one subscription. Multi-factor authentication. Now we all know about this and its importance. And for those who don't know what MFA is, you really should know by now. It's also known as 2FA or two-step verification. And if you're not using it, you need to be planning on implementing it soon. MFA is so important in this day and age as it acts as an extra layer of defense if a user's credentials are stolen, whether that be via a phishing scam or credential stuffing using matching passwords from an unrelated data breach. If an attacker attempts to log into the user's account with stolen credentials, they won't gain access if MFA is enabled as they will not have the user's nominated mobile device. An authenticator app should be used over SMS or email as the latter two methods can be intercepted or compromised, rendering MFA redundant. So something like Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator would work just fine in this instance. Conditional access should be considered with MFA in case of the verification method being compromised. We do a lot of security checks at Planet IT for both fully managed and unmanaged customers. And one of the first things we check is whether MFA is enabled for users in 365 or Azure Active Directory. As a minimum, we say global administrators must have MFA enforced and that if MFA is not enabled for all users, the customer should look to enable it ASAP. But multi-factor authentication is only a tiny piece of a much bigger picture and should be used in conjunction with conditional access. Conditional access is the, an Azure Active Directory tool where a user or a group is granted or denied access to a resource based on certain conditions. There are different conditions that can be configured, such as the user or sign-in risk, device platform such as Windows or Mac OS, and location such as IP address or geolocation. For example, we can, uh, we can set a conditional access policy assigned to all users, excluding global administrators, where if the location is using the corporate network external IP address range and the device platform is Microsoft Windows, then access is granted without the need for multi-factor authentication, provided that the device is marked as compliant in Microsoft Intune. On the other hand, you can also, for example, create a policy that denies access for all users if their location is anywhere other than the UK. This is particularly useful if your users are all based in the UK and there is no chance of them working abroad. This policy example would add geolocation protection and block overseas login attempts. You can craft your conditional access rules to be as granular as you need them to be, and you can test them with a what if tool within Azure, which will tell you what rules will apply to a particular user or group given the specified variables. Conditional access is available within the Azure Active Directory P1 license, which is included in EMS E3 or Microsoft 365 E3. 
EMS provides a security center where you can review and resolve any risks or weak uh, configurations. Secure Score is a tool that provides recommended improvements, and if these recommendations are addressed, the security score of your environment will improve. In our example here, you can see recommendations such as enabling BitLocker on supported devices, blocking code injection and blocking executable content from emails and more. It's worth noting that the secure score will be higher if you have an EMS E5 license versus the EMS E3, as more security resources are available to you and therefore your environment will potentially be more secure. Naturally, you are going to want to take the proactive and preventative approach rather than be fighting fires and reacting to security incidents. That's why you should utilize all of the tools available to you within the Microsoft 365 E5 suite, which includes Office 365 apps and enterprise mobility and security. Multi-factor authentication on conditional access are security tools that you should absolutely be configuring to prevent unwanted system access and to secure connections from trusted devices. The security score tool will advise you of best practices and configuration recommendations to help you manage and further secure your remote workforce. So there you have it, a brief overview of Microsoft Enterprise Mobility and Security and how it fits into the Microsoft 365 stack. EMS is a powerful security management solution, and not only is it ideal for organizations already using Office 365, but it is also available as a standalone product. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Feel free to reach out. In the meantime, I'll hand back over to James Dell. Thanks, Adam. So I wanted to come back to this puzzle piece that I talked about at the start. So obviously we've got that Microsoft 365 piece in the middle. Now we now know that you know around Intune, around the pieces around device compliance and control around application management, software updates and keeping those devices controlled. We also know that with EMS from Microsoft Enterprise Mobility and Security, you can protect the environment beyond just the standard pieces that we all know like MFA we've got the conditional access suite we have the ability to control devices to a much granular level and put that shield around 365. Now we often get asked the questions about well, what do I have to do and what do Microsoft do for my protection obviously the, the, the key there is that Microsoft 365 they'll do everything they can within the limitations of what you're paying for on the platform but the enterprise mobility and security suite is designed to allow you to step up as an organization and tick some of those compliance boxes you have for your other you know, requirements ISO 27001 cyber essentials cyber essentials plus that's the idea the EMS suite allows you to step into those areas and really think about how you should be controlling and protecting your environment and bring together those puzzle pieces to give you the whole picture. Now you if you wanted to reach out to us directly after this call to have a conversation around any of the things we've talked about or to understand further around you know what 365 can do and maybe some of the features that you don't have access to at the moment that you you think you could use then you've got both mine and Adam's details on the screen there and feel free to reach out to us at any time we're always available um, to anyone who wants to have a conversation around these pieces. As I mentioned right at the start, obviously this is a continuation of our ongoing webinar series. We've been doing these every month now. Um, and next month we've got an extra special event where we're talking about how to build a solid foundation, be prepared and maximize your investment in cyber protection measures. Now, we're actually lucky enough to have a ex-CISO joining us from Glue who will be talking around the real world of being in that kind of security information officer's role, the, the real term risks that you're trying to face and some of those protection measures that maybe he's implemented that didn't go well, some that did go well and some areas that you know, we can all learn to improve. So that's happening on Wednesday the 25th of August, so the last Thursday of the month again at 2 p.m. using Teams Live as we always do. Now I'm going to jump over and my staff and Adam will answer some of the questions in the Q&A. So give me one second while I open the correct window. <laughs> um, and we'll be all good. So the um, the first question I've got here is, um, do you think full conditional access is needed? Um, therefore, from what we've been saying, is MFA strong enough on its own or do you need conditional access? I suppose, Adam, that's a great question for you to jump in on. Yeah, I mean, look, MFA is great, uh, it, it, but it's it's the minimum level of access that you should have. You know, if, if someone was to steal your phone, I know it's protected by PIN, but hypothetically someone steals your phone and they've then got access to the Authenticator app, or they're able to get into your uh, backup email address 
to get the MFA codes, then MFA isn't stopping anything. It's it's a great first level of defense, but with conditional access, you've also got the additional protections. Um, most importantly, probably is the user or sign in risk. Um, if a user has a high risk, it's going to have things like impossible travel where you've got two logins from different countries within 10 minutes of each other. Obviously, that's going to be impossible to, to, to travel between the two to actually do that genuinely. So that's going to be a, a, a bad login, a risky login. Um, you've also got known bad reputation IP addresses. So if, if you set up conditional access to say block high risk logins, anything from a risky IP address or even anything from one of the um, VPN services like NordVPN or something like that, it'll automatically be denied because it's known to be a bad reputation. So it's all about layering the protection that you have. You know, all of these protections are great, but having just one is just not sufficient. So multi-factor authentication plus conditional access just need to work together to provide you with the best protection. Yeah, definitely. So jumping on what um, you just said, that Adam, I see I was speaking to a customer the other day. One of the things that you can do with conditional access, which is some of the granularity that comes in, is you can say, well, we allow staff to look at our SharePoint data on through the web browser on you know an up-to-date Chrome, an up-to-date Mozilla, up-to-date Safari. But what we don't allow them to do is download the data or install the OneDrive applications or sync the data or take data away. Suddenly, we're using conditional access to leverage a greater level of data protection, which we can't do without that access on the system. So it definitely has value. MFA is a must. As, as much as we always go on about it, it, is that kind of the baseline that you should, everyone should have in place for all users because it's so easy to compromise an account and compromise a business if that's not in place. So definitely echoing what you're saying now, Adam. Mm -hmm. So um, next question, I'll try and try and read at the same time. Um, so we have a question around Intune policies and profiles, um, specifically around um, sort of government um, NCFC requirements. So in terms of configuring um, Intune profiles and policies, they are there for you to be as flexible as you need to be with them. So Microsoft give you baselines, as they call them, which are built around Microsoft best practice, but you, just like group policy, can configure them in any way that you want. Now, the, the key there is if there's guidance in terms of requirements that your organization must follow, so whether that's HIPAA requirements, um, NCSC requirements, where you've got ISO requirements, you can then layer that information into those policies just like you do, would do with group policy. Now, the trick is there's no one size fits all. Um, you do sometimes have to, to have that kind of logical decision. What we generally do as a business when we're deploying in tune is we'll sit and do like a brown paper exercise where we'll sit and talk around what you need to do, what requirements you need to hit. We'll then bring essentially a templated, this is what you can configure inside of Intune, the kind of flow chart of yes, no decisions of what you're allowed to do, and then build up some profiles and some policies that work to your business requirements around this, and then we can test them and validate them against your requirements. Um, as I said, it's not a one size fits all because some people like to join Intune at the baseline for mobile phones and bring your own device approaches. And some people like to do it from the corporate level and think about managing all devices across the entire board. And it's just finding that mix of what works for you. And um, I said, there is some templates and some baselines from Microsoft, but we generally say it's better to sit down and do those kind of, those brown paper, white paper exercises um, at the start of a rollout. So next one. <laughs> Barry's keeping me on my toes here, firing far through so quickly, and no, I'm joking. So, in terms of the next question, so Matt's asked around the differences between the licensing, and obviously licensing with Microsoft is a minefield, um, and likewise the the cost is a minefield. So, Matt's specific, specific, specifically asking about the cost difference and if there's a way to leverage different licensings to get the same kind of features. Now, as Adam alluded to with EMS. Um, they all of those features can be purchased separately. Now, there is a cost saving if you're going to buy all of the features to buy the EMS bundle. That's why Microsoft do it. But actually, if you only really want, for example, you know, hybrid um, Azure AD join, or if you only actually want to have conditional access, or you only want Intune, then sometimes it's more cost effective to juggle the licenses and go, well, we'll buy business standard for these users plus E3. Um, 
uh, EMS for some users or just plus conditional access, plus um, a, you know, Azure AD protection for some users. It's all a case of finding the user case and then bouncing the right pieces there of the puzzle. And I think that's on a business per business basis. There's no one size fits all. As much as Microsoft would love me to stand here today and say to you, right, everyone must buy EMS E5 because it's the most expensive bundle. That's not the right fit for everybody. And that's the honest answer. In terms of costings for EMS, if you look at EMS E3, its retail prices are £6.60 um, for standard corporate purchasing, um, and EMS E5 is £11.20. Now, you do have access to non for profit pricing um, and um, educational discounts. You also do have access to discounts depending on if you're buying that via Microsoft directly or if you're buying it through a CSP partner like Planet IT, where we have access to lower pricing than that we can offer you. But the retail price for those two units obviously is a considerable add on. If you're only paying £10 a month for business standard, to suddenly double that cost to add the um, EMS E5 onto it as well suddenly changes that approach. So it's really understanding what you need in terms of the licenses, the features you want to get. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Adam. Um, yeah, so just like you said, it's um, it's definitely a mixed bag. You you can miss mix and match depending on what your users need. You know, now me being security focused, of course, I'm going to sit here and say, oh yeah, the EMS E5 license is absolutely what you need, and you need to configure it all to the hilt. But the honest answer, just to echo what James said, is some of those features, you you know, you may not need them and you may not need them for all users. You know, you may have a, a set of users that they come in once a week into the office. They've got a desktop that never leads, leaves the building. So, you know, half of those features wouldn't actually be used for those users. So, so yeah, pretty much what you said, James. Perfect. I've got another question that's um, just come in around um, trial availability of EMS and um, Intune. So um, both features of e the EMS on its own and Microsoft Intune, um, they are not available as trial licenses like E5 is, where you can try an E5 upgrade. And um, the reason for this is something that probably Adam will help me uh, allude to here, which is that once you configure these products, they are integrated into your system. So you turn conditional access on, you get used to using them. There are, there's a lot of upfront work required to get you to the line where you can use EMS well or you can use Intune well. And if you're doing it on a trial for 30 days, you're not likely to see the leverage or the benefits from this. Now, obviously, with all Microsoft CSP licensing, you can buy it monthly and you can obviously turn it on and off as you as you want. You only need a single license to try the, the product. So you can deploy it in a limited feature, but Microsoft don't directly offer um, EMS trials at this point. Um, it's something that they they generally think that most people buy it and stick with it. I don't know if you um, have anything else to add on that, Adam. Yeah, just like with the conditional access policies and stuff like that. It, it anything Azure really takes time to kind of craft and and mould to your requirements. So you could spend half a day sitting there or a couple of days even creating conditional access policies and testing them and making sure they're right for you. Uh, are you going to want to do that if you're on a free trial or 30 day trial? You know, um, it's the kind of thing that once you've got it, you want you put in the work to set it and it set it and forget it kind of thing, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with what you say there. Definitely. I suppose the um, unless there's any more questions coming in, the, the final point I want to make around what we're seeing with a lot of the requirements for certainly for Intune at the moment are coming from the shift in business requirements to achieve certification for cyber insurance, so Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus, and the level of management and reporting and oversight that's required to, to tick those boxes and to keep your cyber insurance companies happy. Now, um, we've seen a massive influx in the last probably six months of businesses coming to us and saying, we need a product like Intune to give us you know, device updates, application control, to give us the ability to turn devices off, to tick requirements for Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus, so they could then get the cyber insurance their business needs. So we're certainly seeing there's an industry push outside of anything that we could say about Microsoft or what we could say about, you know, wanting to talk to you about products. Actually talking to you about the real world that we're seeing is there's requirements for this being pushed through. And it may well be that next time your cyber insurance is up for renewal, that you start seeing these requirements creep in in terms of we expect to see X, Y and Z. And that's specifically, I think, where Microsoft are coming at with these EMS bundles is let's try and tick a requirement 
that we're starting to see with businesses because as Adam alluded to, their, their previous incarnation, the previous bundles that Microsoft made before EMS came along, they didn't really make much sense. They weren't something that every business wanted. It was something that was a very unique use case, but we're certainly seeing with EMS a massive uptake and with Intune a massive uptake, certainly in 2021 following all the events of last year. Um, I don't think any more questions have come in. So what I'll do then is I'll let all of you have a little bit more of your afternoon back because you're um, we're finishing a little bit early. But I would like to say thank you very much for joining us again. If you do think of anything in the meantime that you go, I wish I would have asked that question, then feel free to reach out. What I will do um, is make sure that we put our details back on the screen quickly for you. So you can see that. So feel free to reach out if you do have any additional questions. You want to have a chat or one to one or you want to get both of us on the call. More than happy to do that. Um, but apart from that, thank you very much for your time and for joining us again on this latest Planet webinar. Thank you.